for the wheel from the University of Florida. He also has some chairs in um, IP Paris and the um, University of Washington. Uh, Clifford, the um, field of interest is the general relativity, invented 100 years ago, created 100 years ago. And um, he has uh, many important contributions to, th to this field. In, uh, for example, he was, he, for many years he was the um, chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee for Gravity Probe B, which was a very big $1 billion NASA mission to uh, test GR. And um, he also has a very important contribution, theoretical contribution to our understanding of, of uh, the Olsen Pilo uh, and Tyler um, double pulsar, which um, this kind of object uh, till this day are the best evidence we have for the existence of uh, gravitational radiation. And um, today, the title of his, his talk is uh, Was Einstein Right? So, thank you, Cliff. So this year we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the development of uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity. In fact, it's 100 years plus a day because on November 25th he presented in the fourth of a series of lectures at the Prussian Academy of Sciences, he presented the final version of his theory uh, on that November 25th. Now there's a kind of fairy tale history of, the, of general relativity that goes something like this. In 1905, he found special relativity. He then turned his attention to gravity and struggled for quite a number of years. And in 1915, he found uh, general relativity. In 1919, Eddington proved that the theory was correct by measuring the deflection of starlight by the sun. And after that, everybody lived happily ever, ever after the whole theory was a triumph. Well, that happily, live, happily living ever after is not quite accurate. In fact, there were tremendous uh, uncertainties about the experiments that supposedly verified the theory, a great deal of skepticism in some quarters. In addition, there was a great deal of difficulty understanding this theory conceptually, just trying to understand what it was, what it predicted, what it all meant. And then thirdly, there was a, a general feeling of, in that time that the theory really didn't have much to say about ordinary physics and astronomy. It predicted some very tiny effects that otherwise weren't very interesting. And the one area where it did make some kind of a difference, cosmology, in those days was hardly a poster child for verifying anything, given that observations in those days told us that the universe was younger than the Earth. So uh, there, there was a, a great deal of a problem with the theory in the early times. And as a res result of these, uh, for the next 40 years or so, general relativity as a subject went into a deep decline. And so by the 19, end of the 1950s, it was considered to be in the backwaters of physics and astronomy, not a fit subject for a serious scientist to pursue. There are many stories that illustrate this attitude toward general relativity in those days, but my favorite, and it kind of connects to me personally, um, was this one. In 1961, a young man just graduating from Caltech with his bachelor's degree was on his way to Princeton to uh, do graduate studies. And this young man was told by a very famous Caltech astronomer, when you get to Princeton, whatever you do, do not study general relativity because it will never have anything to do with physics or astronomy. Luckily for me, uh, that young man ignored that advice. His name was Kip Thorne. And around the time that Kip was starting his graduate studies at Caltech, in fact, general relativity was beginning a very remarkable renaissance. And so by 10 years later, it was one of the hot subjects of physics. This was brought about in large part due to uh, astronomical discoveries, such as quasars, pulsars, and the three degree background, that made it clear that general relativity actually would play an important role in astronomy and astrophysics. But it was also fueled in part by the development of new ways to test general relativity. So this period that began sort of in the 60s and lasted for the rest of that uh, century of general relativity was characterized by three main themes. So the use of high precision technology such as atomic clocks, the whole space program that was developing in the 1960s to, to produce new and very precise tests of general relativity. The development of theoretical frameworks that allowed one to compare general relativity with alternative theories of gravity and even allowed you to invent new tests of general relativity that you would have never thought of if you were simply focusing your attention on that, uh, that uh, theory alone. 
And then finally, a growing uh, synergy between theorists and experimentalists in gravitational physics. I am old enough to remember a time when a typical uh, astronomer had no idea what the Riemann tensor was or why general covariance was so important. And a typical general relativist didn't have the slightest clue what Nyquist noise was or what the magnitude of a star was. But that has completely changed. And today, in gravitational physics, theorists and experimentalists talk to each other. They speak common languages. And I can think of no better illustration of that than the 900-member LIGO-Virgo scientific collaboration put together to detect gravitational waves, a collaboration that includes pure general relativity theorists, optical coatings people, seismic isolation experts, engineers, data analysis analysts, all who get on the same telecon and talk to each other and really learn to speak a common language and learn to really talk to each other. And that, that synergy has really transformed the field of gravitational physics in the second half of that century. But now as we look to the second century of general relativity, I think testing GR will be, uh, there will be two, three themes that will kind of be focused on. One, testing general relativity in the strong field regime, in regimes very close to black holes or neutron stars or inside neutron stars where gravitational potential is very strong. Tests of general relativity using gravitational waves. There's a very good chance we'll begin detecting gravitational waves regularly within the next five years, and one can use those wave signals to perform tests of GR. And finally, tests of GR at extreme ranges, and here notably at the, at the Hubble scale, uh, finding out whether general relativity is really valid at the scale, on the scales of the universe as a whole. And what I want to do in this talk is to kind of discuss uh, tests of general relativity, but around kind of three uh, themes. One, I'm going to give a little bit of the history of the early struggles, the difficulties of testing GR in those early years. Then I'll talk about some highlights from that first century, tests ma mainly done in the second half of the century that, uh, that really checked Einstein's theory. And then it, along the way, I'll mention just a few selected areas where to give you an idea of what uh, we might be able to do in the future for testing GR, especially with waves and in the strong field regime. And I want to do that by in, in discussing four specific topics. I'm a general relativist, so I think of gravity as being synonymous with geometry. It's curved space-time, so I always use this geometric language. And the four phenomena I want to talk about are geometry bending light, geometry warping time, moving mass, and making waves. And all of these really go back almost to Einstein's original 1915 work plus a bit something he published in 1916. So it's really links directly back to Einstein. Okay? So the first topic, geometry bends light, obviously brings us to the famous experiment by Eddington to measure the bending of light by the sun. So on May 29, 1919, Eddington, who put together two teams of astronomers, one went to Sobral, a city in northern Brazil, the other went to Principe, an island off the coast of Equatorial Guinea uh, in Africa, to photograph stars during a total solar eclipse. The idea is that when the, the moon blocks the sun, you see a bit of the solar photosphere, but it's dark enough to actually see stars in the sky near the sun. And the idea is to compare a photograph like this with a photograph of the same star field taken when the sun is not that, in that part of the sky. And then you compare the two photographs and measure the tiny displacement of each star away from the sun induced by the bending of light due to general relativity. And when, in November 1919, six months later, Eddington announced at the a meeting of the Royal Society of London that he had measured the bending and that it agreed with general relativity, it caused an overnight international sensation. Two days later in the New York Times, proclaimed, lights all askew in the heavens. Men of science, notice only men of science, no women of science, right? More or less agog over re results. Not completely agog, just more or less agog. Stars not where they seem, but don't worry, and so on. So you get the, the idea of the kind of breathless headlines that came out uh, in, in those days. And this, these kinds of headlines made Einstein himself as a person an international superstar, sort of the first scientific celebrity that we ever had. Uh, and so many pictures of Einstein doing great things Charlie Chad with Charlie Chaplin, playing, playing the violin in the Berlin synagogue, 
with David Ben-Gurion. Apparently, they, they asked Einstein to be the first president of Israel, and to everybody's relief, he declined. <laughs> here, with, here with the Hopi Indians in Arizona, and here he's showing that learning relativity is as easy as riding a bicycle, right? And, you know, in Time Magazine in 2000 declared him the, the person of the century. So he, he personally became this famous, famous icon. But as I said, around the same time as he was becoming famous, his theory was entering this deep decline so that people weren't really working on it. And in fact, those early measurements by Eddington, there was a considerable skepticism about those results, especially among American astronomers. For example, in June of 1919, before Eddington's report in November, Campbell and Curtis of the Lick Observatory in US reported their examination of, of, of photographs during the eclipses of, eight, of 1900 and 1918, and they had failed to find any deflection. So they had a negative result reported uh, in June before Eddington's positive result. And in fact, in America, there was a lot of skepticism of, of, of Eddington's uh, data analysis and of his results. And of course, at the same time in Germany, there was, with the rising tide of uh, anti-Semitism after the First World War, there were campaigns put together by notable physicists like uh, Lennard and Stark to discredit Einstein, to discredit his theories, uh, and to uh, cast doubt on Eddington's results. So as a result, it became important to really repeat these measurements to see if they are, are correct, to see if this really does constitute a verification of Einstein's theory. And what I want to do is to show you a bit of the history of measuring the deflection of light. But I want to do it in a, in a, using a particular language. It's a language in which you allow a certain parameter to depend on the theory that you're looking at. And in this parametrized version of, of a theories of gravity, the overall size of the deflection of light, of any light ray about any body, is governed by this factor, 1 plus gamma over 2. So this is really what you want to measure when you measure the deflection of light. The one-half part, one over two part, that's what you would get if you simply did a Newtonian calculation of the bending of an orbit about a massive body in the limit when the orbit has the speed of light. So that's often called the Newtonian deflection. The other part, the gamma over two part, is the part that comes from the actual curvature of space. Locally straight lines near the massive body are themselves bent compared to locally straight lines that are far from the body. So that additional bending adds to the effect so the total is the sum of the two, a Newtonian effect plus a space curvature effect. So this coefficient you're measuring, gamma is one in general relativity, so the prediction of general relativity on this scale is just that line. Okay? We'll, we'll look at the bottom half of this diagram in a moment. So, and plotted here is, is year from about 1920 to the present, and this dot with those error bars, and that arrow pointing somewhere on the floor above us, are the results from the two Eddington expeditions. And later measurements during solar eclipses in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s weren't much better. Several of them were between one and a half and two times the uh, Einstein prediction. None, of course, supported Newtonian theory, which would be on the floor below us, half. That was certainly ruled out. But these were hardly ringing endorsements for Einstein's theory. But the real revolution in measuring the deflection of light came in the 1960s with the development of radio astronomy and the discovery of quasars. And so for about eight years, from 1968 to the middle 70s, people measured the deflection of radio waves from quasars, reaching ultimately precisions of, at about a percent level. And then in recent years, the results have gotten even better by dramatic factors using very long baseline interferometry. Here the idea is to use these uh, uh, Radio interferometers distributed around the world, meant there are about uh, 70 or 80 of such installations around the world, looking at quasars and radio sources distributed over the entire sky. You don't have, just have to look at something whose light passes by the sun. An object whose light ray is coming in 90 degrees from the sun is deflected by 4 milli arc seconds. The modern VLBI works at between 10 and 100 micro arc seconds and can easily measure that deflection. So these analyses are global analyses of over 500 radio sources around the entire sky, most of them far from the sun. And basically, you have to take into account the distortion of the, of the celestial sphere caused by the bending of light in every single direction. A global fit of all that data yields agreement with general relativity at about a part in 10,000. So just very high precision uh, test of this bending of light now. 
Back at optical wavelengths, the Hipparchos satellite launched by the European Space Agency measured, looked at about a million stars in our galaxy and measured the deflection to a part per, per a thousand. And Gaia, a currently operating astrometric uh, uh, optical interferometer in space, hopes to measure the, the bending to a part per million by looking at uh, a billion stars down to about 20th magnitude and measuring their positions precisely. But I want to say something about this line here, which I think is really kind of cool. This is a measurement that uh, took data on 15 elliptical galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. For each elliptical galaxy, you can measure the velocity dispersion of all the stars within the galaxy. Using that velocity dispersion, you can build a model for the gravitational potential of the galaxy, including the contribution of dark matter, which affects the velocities of all the stars in the galaxy. So you build a model of the potential. Use that model to calculate the, the nature of gravitational lensing of background sources around the galaxy and compare that prediction with the observed gravitational lensing. Fitting that all together for those 15 galaxies, you can make an estimate of this coefficient, and there's the result. The accuracy is about comparable to Eddington's original accuracy, but I just think it's cool that this is bending of light on galactic scales, not just on solar system scales. Of course, a related effect is the Shapiro time delay. It's, a, it's an actual delay in the propagation of uh, uh, light through curved space-time. It depends on the same coefficient discovered by radio astronomer Erwin Shapiro theoretically and then first verified by him by bouncing radar signals off Venus. But then in recent years, the best test, in fact, the best limit on this gamma parameter comes from tracking the Cassini spacecraft during a period when it was on its way to Saturn and on the far side of the sun measure the delay of the signal as they pass by the sun. Now a part in 10 to the 5. So that's the best bound to date. Of course, uh, the bending of light has morphed into the gravitational lens, uh, now a, a, a key tool for astronomers uh, where uh, light from distant objects is split into multiple images or rings or simply distorted into arcs by the gravitational bending of light uh, caused by foreground galaxies or clusters. Gravitational lensing is used to now to map the distribution of dark matter in the universe, study dark energy. It's even been used to find a few new exoplanets. So it, just, I like to call this Einstein's gift to astronomy because it's become such a, an important tool. And it actually really is Einstein's gift to astronomy because the first person to calculate the properties of a gravitational lens was Einstein himself. But this fact wasn't discovered until 1997. In 1997, Jürgen Wren, a historian of science, and his colleagues were going through Einstein's notebooks leading up to the general theory to try to find out how precisely day-to-day -day did he get to the general theory. And in some notebooks from 1912, they found some pages where he calculated the, the splitting of, of a distant object into two images if the light passed by a star between the two. So he calculated the angle, the, the lensing angle, and he calculated the magnification of both images. Everything was completely correct, except it was wrong by a factor of two, because in 1912 he was using an early version of his theory of gravity that only gave the Newtonian half the deflection, not the full uh, deflection. But otherwise, the calculation was completely correct. But Einstein never published it because he figured, what are the chances of two stars being so perfectly aligned that you could get this splitting? He didn't realize, as Fritz Zwicky did 20 years later, that what you really need is a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies to act as the lens, so you don't need perfect alignment. But we might, we might forgive Einstein for not discovering this idea, because in 1912, it wasn't even clear that there were galaxies outside the Milky Way. So, you know, give the guy a break for, you know, for, not, for missing that. So this, I like this, this really is Einstein's gift to, to astronomy. Of course, the deflection of light has also entered the, the popular culture. I show here an image of the supermassive black hole Gargantua from the movie Interstellar, as seen from Miller's Planet. Those of you who have seen the movie remember Miller's Planet is the planet that the three astronauts in that movie were exploring as a possible home for mankind. And this is what the black hole would look like. So the black part is the part where light isn't coming from the black hole. This is an accretion disk of hot gas around the black hole. But here you are seeing the top of the accretion disk behind the black hole. Light is coming off that accretion disk, bending by 90 degrees into your eye. And here you're seeing the bottom of the accretion disk behind the black hole. So this is very strong gravitational lensing near the black hole. And this image is actually, it was produced by Kip Thorne, who was an executive producer on that movie. 
Um, and it's based on real ray calculations of the motion of light in a rotating uh, Kerr geometry of a real rotating black hole. So it's based on, there's real science in the background of this image that came in the movie. In fact, Kippen and the colleagues from the special effects team later published this work in classical and quantum gravity. Of course, the most important thing about this picture is that since I was a PhD student of Kipp, that puts me at one degree of separation from Anne Hathaway and Jessica Chastain. <laughs> Just saying. Now, movies are one thing, but science is another. And in fact, there are plans to uh, really think about imaging a black hole uh, in real life. And this would be the black hole at the center of our galaxy, the four and a half million solar mass black hole. And the idea of imaging that black hole uh, is a goal of a project called the Event Horizon Telescope, an array of telescopes around the world, including the South Pole Telescope, ALMA, uh, and various other ones, working at millimeter wavelengths so as to have angular resolution at the galactic center that is of the same size as the event horizon of the black hole there. They would also have angular resolution, uh, event horizon angular resolution at the black hole in M87. It's a thousand times further away, but it's a thousand times more massive, so it's the same angular size on the, on the sky. And so what you would see, say, for the black hole in our galactic center is something like this. There's not a strong accretion disk in that case. It's rather feeble. So what you really see is the shadow of the black hole, the place where photons aren't coming. But then this, you see this array where light is circling the black hole at what's called the light ring, a place where they could go on circular, unstable orbits, one and a half times the Schwarzschild radius, and then, get, then can come out and, and be seen by us. So this is like an accumulation of, pho of photons that go around the black hole before arriving at our telescope. And what they hope to do with the Event Horizon Telescope is to ask, suppose I change the geometry on the black hole from a pure Kerr black hole to one where you tweak one of the parameters of that model, like the quadrupole moment. If you tweak it by some amount, uh, then uh, the, the shadow would look, have a different shape. So this would be pure Kerr, and this would be Kerr with a certain parameter of 0.8, and this would be the same parameter of minus 0.8. Uh, a tweak parameter for the geometry, so you could tell the difference between a real black hole of GR and uh, something that might not be a general relativistic black hole. So this would be a, a kind of strong field test that you could start to do with uh, this telescope or this project. Okay, geometry warps time. So this is the second of Einstein's, what Einstein called his crucial test, deflection of light, gravitational redshift, and uh, Mercury's perihelion. But in fact, he had this idea, the gravitational redshift, long before general relativity. Already in 1907, he realized that there should be a shift in the frequency of light going up or down a gravitational field by simply realizing that an elevator being accelerated in empty space is equivalent to an elevator sitting at rest on the Earth. And in the, in the accelerated elevator, a photon emitted from the roof of the elevator would be blue shifted by the time it reached the bottom because the bottom has started to move up because of the acceleration. So there'd be a blue shift in this accelerated elevator, so there must be an equivalent blue shift in an elevator at rest on Earth. So this blue shift, red shift effect then, uh, he already knew just by the, from the principle of equivalence, and he called it later his happiest thought because it really led him toward the theory of general relativity. And in the full theory, naturally, it comes out automatically as a prediction. So when the theory was published, the, that first obvious step is to measure it. And where would you measure the redshift? You'd measure the redshift of spectral lines from the surface of the sun using the solar potential. And the first attempt in 1917 by Charles E. St. John and by another team at the Kodia Canal Observatory in India was a failure. They did not, could not detect they found no gravitational redshift, no evidence for Einstein's redshift. Some historians of science claim that this negative report by St. John went a long way toward killing Einstein's chances for the Nobel Prize in 1918 and 1919. And he didn't actually win it until 1921. And then it was for the photoelectric effect. The Nobel Committee likes to give prizes to things for which there's experimental evidence, and the photoelectric effect was a clear one. In those days, in 1921, the experimental evidence for general relativity was considered to be so weak that it did not deserve a Nobel Prize. So, 
On the other hand, we sort of understand why this is so difficult. The solar surface, atoms on the solar surface are subjected to very strong convective and turbulent motions. Some atoms experience very strong pressure shifts uh, at the solar surface. And so disentangling the environmental shifts from the gravitational shift is a very complicated problem. And uh, so that's undoubtedly why they failed to really measure the Einstein shift. So in fact, the first real measurement of the gravitational redshift effect didn't come until 1960 with the famous Pound-Repka experiment. This looked at the shift in the frequency of gamma rays emitted from unstable iron nuclei uh, going up or down the uh, Jefferson Tower on the Harvard University campus uh, and exploiting the Mossbauer effect to achieve very narrow uh, lines for the gamma rays. They reached about a 10% a level and then a few years later improved that to about 1%. Finally, in 1962, and, and later in 72, and then another team in 1991, they finally, using better spectral resolution and better modeling of the solar surface, were finally able to measure the solar redshift and to separate all the different effects. Uh, this one reached about a 1% test of the redshift. The best, uh, most accurate test of the gravitational redshift effect came from gravity probe A, in which a hydrogen maser clock the most stable atomic clock at that time was launched on a suborbital rocket and the rate of that clock was compared uh, with an identical hydrogen maser clock on the ground. That verified the effect to about a part in 10,000. And from the 1980s on, of course, the gravitational redshift has played a crucial role in uh, global navigational systems such as GPS, the US system. The point is that all the 24 satellites in the GPS system uh, have atomic clocks on board and you navigate by noting the, the time on the clock and the time of arrival of signals. But clocks on GPS satellites tick faster than clocks on the ground by about 37 nanoseconds per day. That seems like a small amount, except when you realize that time in the GPS system globally has to be known at all times to 50 nanoseconds in order to achieve 15 meter navigational precision. So 39,000 nanoseconds is a huge effect and it builds up day by day. So the relativistic effects have to be taken into account in GPS in order for it to function properly. So since I'm a general relativist, I love to talk about GPS because it is a practical application, albeit the only practical application, <laughs> of general relativity. And during this period, these kinds of advances in atomic timekeeping have led to a, a host, hundreds of experiments using cold atom clocks, Bose-Einstein clocks, and tangled atom clocks clocks based on all the latest uh, quantum technology have tested the uh, general relativity, uh, the warpage of time by general relativity to exquisite precision. But I want to mention just one, which is my current favorite among all of these hundreds of uh, high precision experiments. This is an experiment done in David Weinland's lab at the University of Colorado using uh, ultra cold aluminum ions as clocks. They compared two such clocks separated by this amount they could measure the difference in rate between this clock and that clock. It wasn't of terribly high precision measurement, but they could measure and see the effect. Lately, I've been wondering why my brain seems to be aging so much faster than my feet. Now I understand why. I, mean, I think we should suspend ourselves 12 hours each day to kind of equalize. Anyway, uh, having, really showing that time ticks differently on scales like this is, I think, uh, really fantastic and really, you know, it's something you can tell the general public. They say, does time tick differently? Yes, we, there's a real example. In this room, time is different there than it is there. And then we're all waiting for the launch in 2017 of a project called ACES Faro, in which a, an array of ultra-cold uh, cold atom clocks will be put on the International Space Station with the goal of measuring the gravitational redshift at the part per million level. So geometry moves mass. Well, in one sense, this is kind of trivial. We know gravity moves mass, and Newton told us that. But here, I obviously want to talk about the corrections to the motion of mass that are introduced by general relativity. And that brings us, of course, to the third of Einstein's crucial tests, the perihelion advance of Mercury. But this story really goes back into the 19th century, uh, to the middle of the 19th century, with uh, Jean-Joseph Le Verrier, who was at the time the director of the Paris Observatory. You may remember that Le Verrier at this point was already very famous because he had noticed that certain anomalies in the orbit of the planet Uranus 
could be explained if there were an additional planet outside Uranus's orbit. His calculations were so good that he could predict, roughly speaking, where in the sky that planet should be, and within a few days of receiving his, 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 his pr prediction, uh, astronomers in Berlin discovered the planet, and we, that's the planet we now call Neptune. At the time, Leverrier was said to be the only person to have discovered a planet using pen and paper. So fresh from that triumph, uh, and having been promoted to, 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 uh, to a secure job, he tackled a more controversial subject, this perihelion advance. And already by the middle of the 1800s, it was known that Mercury's perihelion, its elliptical orbit, advanced, precessed at a rate of 575 arc seconds per century. And so Leverrier set out to explain that, and the obvious explanation is through the perturbations of all the other planets in the solar system, he could, have, he could surely account for it, and so he did the calculation for each planet that he knew of, um, and came up with 530 arc seconds per century, 40 plus arc seconds short of the measured amount. And this was a, a tremendous problem and crisis. No one could figure out what this, uh, how to resolve this problem. But in the spirit of Neptune, uh, Leverrier and his, and his contemporaries proposed the obvious solution. Surely there must be a planet inside the orbit of Mercury. If you gave it the right orbit and the right mass, you could account for the 43 arc seconds per century. This planet would have to be very hot since it's closer than Mercury, so they gave it a name Vulcan after the Roman god of fire. I believe this is the first time in history of physicists demonstrating their absolutely fantastic skill at giving really, really cool names to things about which they have no absolutely nothing. The contemporary example of that skill, of course, is dark energy. But despite 50 years of trying, there is no, and there, there, are, there are many sightings of this planet, but there were no confirmed sightings of the planet over time. And by the turn of the century, when Einstein was thinking about gravity, uh, it was, remained an open problem, this perihelion advance of Mercury. And so when in 1915, in fact, it was a, a week ago, this year, 100 years ago, uh, Einstein was still trying to finalize his, his third and fourth lectures. He still didn't have the, the theory in the form that he liked. He settled on a form, and then he calculated the perihelion advance of Mercury and got 43 arc seconds per century. He later wrote a friend, so this was in uh, November um, 18, 1919, just before that lecture he got this result. And he told a friend later he thought he was having a heart attack when he finished the calculation. His, his heart was thumping. He was just so excited because this really told him that this final version of the theory was the correct one. The earlier versions had failed to give the right answer. This one was the right one. But this story really does continue. It doesn't end with, uh, with, general, with the invention of general relativity. Today, of course, we know the contribution of all the other planets with much, much better precision than they knew then. We know the orbits of the planets much better just from all the interplanetary uh, tracking of planets and spacecraft. We know their masses much better through orbiters and planetary flyby missions. We have huge ephemeris computer codes to calculate the orbits of planets in full detail to very high precision. We also know the orbit of Mercury much better, largely through radar ranging, bouncing radar signals off the surface of Mercury. And most recently, just in the last few years, important new data points on Mercury's orbit have been provided by the Mercury Messenger orbiter that orbited Mercury for some time before doing a controlled crash on its surface. So tracking that orbiter gave very important new data. So now today, the discrepancy that you have to explain with your favorite theory of gravity, so the observed discrepancy is 42.98 plus or minus 0 0.001 arc seconds per century and general relativity nails it right on the head. So this really is a, a precise test of GR um, today. But this perihelion advance continues to play a role in other areas. Um, here, I want to, this is a kind of complicated plot, but I want to say something about it because it illustrates several of the themes I've talked about and also points us toward future tests of GR. So this is a plot of data from the double pulsar. This is kind of a successor to the famous Hulse-Taylor binary pulsar that was responsible for the first evidence of gravitational waves and a Nobel Prize for Hulse and Taylor. This was discovered later, and for a time, both bodies in this system were observed as pulsars. And what you do is you measure various effects in the, in the system, like the peri-center advance and so on, 
they, and compare these with what's predicted by general relativity. The predictions typically depend on things you know, like the eccentricity of the orbit and the period of the orbit, but also on things you don't know, like the masses of the two bodies. We have no knowledge of these things a priori. So by comparing a prediction with the measurement, you get a bound on the two masses. And you can get several bounds by measuring a variety of different effects. So for example, because both pulsars were seen for a time, you've got the ratio of their Doppler shifts, and that immediately gives you the ratio of their masses. It's just kind of Newtonian kinematics. That then tells you the system must lie along that red line. So that's a purely Newtonian effect because both pulsars were seen and their Doppler shifts were measured. Furthermore, you don't know the inclination angle of the system on the sky, and there's a formula from astronomers who deal with these binary systems called the mass formula that um, you don't know the, the inclination of the angle, but one thing you do know is that sine i is less than 1. And that tells you that the allowed region for the system has to be this blue region. Okay? Otherwise, sine i would be greater than 1 and, and nothing would work. So it has to be on that line and in that blue region. Now you measure the periastron advance, the analog of Mercury's perihelion shift. That depends on the sum of the two masses, so that gives a bound that's a 45 degree line. The sum of the masses is some fixed amount. This is the effect of the gravitational redshift, another of Einstein's crucial tests. That gives a bound, a different bound, because it depends differently on the masses. For some reason, the radio astronomers used the parameter gamma. It's not the same gamma that I talked about, but you can't tell radio astronomers anything. You know, they just ignore whatever you tell them. They refuse to change their notation, but OK. Um, this, these two bounds, S and R, come from the Shapiro time delay. Light deflection plays no role here, but the Shapiro time delay plays a role. And finally, the damping of the orbit, the decrease of its period due to gravitational wave emission, is this bound here. And if general relativity is correct, all these bounds had better overlap at the same point. Otherwise, there would be an inconsistency. And this little region is blown up. So you can see all the various bounds overlap in the same point. And the overlap region is right here in the vertex of this allowed region. And that tells you that the orbit is being seen almost perfectly edge on. Sine i is 0.998. So we're seeing it edge on. But this is also pointing us towards strong field tests of general relativity. Because even though the orbits of these systems are in a regime where you can look at the first order corrections, they <coughs> contain neutron stars. And neutron stars have strong internal gravitational fields. And general relativity is a nonlinear theory. So you might ask, couldn't those nonlinear fields in the inside of the neutron stars somehow act back and change the orbit from what you would have expected if you ignored such effects? In general relativity, that doesn't occur. The internal structure of bodies doesn't affect their orbits as long as you're far enough apart that tidal interactions don't play a role. So it's a unique feature of general relativity that this, this doesn't matter. Uh, but in other theories of gravity, it does matter. The internal structure, especially the gravitational binding energy, can change the orbit, can affect the orbital dynamics. So this is a kind of null test of strong field gravity in that strong field gravity in this kind of a system plays absolutely no role in the orbital dynamics. Let me give another example of uh, the effect of the pericenter advance. And you think of it as a very, very tiny effect. But in some astrophysical situations, it can have an extremely large effect. So this is, uh, I want to show simulations of stars orbiting a, a massive black hole at the center of a galaxy. This is work done by David Merritt, Tal Alexander, Sepa Mikola, and I'm sort of tacked on as the theoretical groupie. They, they do all the hard work, and I sort of uh, stand aside and say, good work, boys. Um, of, and, and what you'll see is stars. Uh, uh, so this is a plot of the semi-major axis of each star, which is really a stand-in for the energy of the stellar, uh, the stellar orbit. You'll see that these things, the energy stay relatively constant because these stars don't exchange a lot of energy. So they'll migrate back and forth roughly horizontally in semi-major axis. But each star torques its neighbor. So stars orbit primarily on Keplerian orbits around the black hole, but they're perturbed by their other stars in the cluster. And those perturbations induce torques. And Torque is, is uh, angular momentum is related to the eccentricity of the orbit. So in this direction are circular orbits, and in this direction are low uh, angular momentum, very eccentric orbits that will come close to the, the black hole. And so you'll see stars migrating 
back and forth in a kind of random walk in eccentricity. Every once in a while a star gets such a high eccentricity that it approaches the black hole and is either captured by the black hole or starts to emit a lot of gravitational radiation and in spirals into the black hole. And these simulations are important because you can use them to calculate the rate at which stars get close to the black hole and emit gravitational waves. And those rates are very important for people who want to design space-based gravitational wave detectors because it really uh, affects the rate at which they might detect such uh, sources. But now, in this simulation, one turns on the pericenter advance due to general relativity. This one's purely Newtonian. And what happens is the stars do continue to migrate. Their eccentricities do this random walk. But when they hit this barrier that uh, we call the Schwarzschild barrier, after, named after the Schwarzschild black hole, they seem to bounce off this barrier and can't get across. And that's because when the eccentricity grows, the rate of advance of the pericenter grows. And so the time scale for that pericenter advance becomes short compared to the time scale for this, this random walk process. And that random walk is quenched. It's similar to the quenching of the COSI mechanism when you include the pericenter advance. Every once in a while, one guy can get through, and now you'll see it soon lose its energy to gravitational waves and be absorbed by the black hole. But in these simulations, including the pericenter advance, the rate of formation of these close uh, encounters that emit gravitational waves was strongly suppressed. So it had, over the long time scale evolutions of these systems, this very tiny effect can build up and have dramatic effects. So there's a, a kind of application in a strong field context or black hole context of Einstein's famous effect. So finally, gravity, uh, geometry makes waves. So this wasn't part of uh, the 1915 uh, papers that, General, uh, that Einstein published. But within a year, he published a paper in which he worked out the gravitational waves that would be emitted by a laboratory type system like a rotating dumbbell and published that in 1916. This paper, however, was so full of errors, it was ridiculous. Gunnar Nordstrom pointed out to Einstein all the errors he had made. He had monopole radiation, he had conceptual errors. It was just full of uh, mistakes. He published another paper in 1918, correcting all those errors, but he still, in the final formula for the flux of gravitational wave energy, he'd made a silly mathematical error, and it was wrong by a factor of two. The factor of two was corrected by Eddington, who figured out where he'd made the mistake, in his famous book on general relativity in 1922. But in that book, Eddington makes a remark that really, in some ways, set back the whole subject of general relativity for decades. He made the remark that gravitational waves propagate with the speed of thought, as if they were, they're sort of something hokey or phony about gravitational waves. It's ironic to make such a statement because Eddington understood precisely <coughs> what gravitational waves were. When you solve Einstein's equations in the linearized approximation, you get two modes of gravitational waves. They travel with the speed of light. They cause physical effects. They're physical waves. But there are also modes, solutions that you get, that are just waves in the coordinate system. They're completely arbitrary. They can travel with the speed of thought. You can give them any speed that you wish but they are not physical because they are just waves of the coordinates. And his remark referred to just these coordinate waves uh, in the solutions. But nevertheless, taken out of context, this remark kind of made the whole subject of gravitational waves mysterious for a long time. A second example, I'll give you another example of this kind of mystery, and it's all related to coordinates. A famous uh, paper that Einstein and Nathan Rosen wrote in 1938. This is Rosen of the EPR paradox fame. An issue they asked was the following. It may be that there are gravitational waves in the linearized theory, but general relativity is a nonlinear theory. Is it possible that the nonlinearities could somehow quench gravitational waves? And they thought they had an answer. They found an exact solution, so it was fully nonlinear, vacuum, an exact vacuum solution of Einstein's theory with waves, so it looked like waves. The trouble was it had a singularity. And singularities are horrible. You cannot accept a singularity. And therefore, there are no gravitational waves. And so they wrote a paper on the, on the non-existence of gravitational waves and submitted it to the Physical Review. At that time, Physical Review had just begun a process of sending papers to anonymous referees. So Tate, the editor of Physical Review, got this paper from Einstein and think, well, we've start, just started sending to referees, but this is a paper from Einstein. What am I going to do? But he did, sent it off to a referee. 
some uh, quite shortly thereafter, maybe a, a few days, it had to be mailed by normal mail, not email, but still days compared to today, you know, months you have to take to get a referee's report back. Um, they, he got the report back, and he sent the report and the paper back to Einstein. Dear Professor Einstein, I'm sending you your paper with a, this long, very long and detailed referee's report. Uh, we look forward to receiving your comments and your revised paper. Einstein immediately wrote back to Physical Review, when Mr. Rosen and I submitted our paper to the Physical Review, we submitted it to be published, not to be sent to an anonymous referee. We are hereby withdrawing the paper. And he never submitted another paper to Physical Review for the rest of his life. He was so angry. Meanwhile, uh, Einstein's other assistant, uh, Leopold Infeld, happened to be chatting with a visitor to Princeton at that time and, and chatting about Einstein, Einstein and Rosen's latest paper. And they were chatting about, and this visitor seemed to know an awful lot about uh, the work, and they were discussing the fact, and the visitor pointed out that the singularity that they had found was a harmless coordinate singularity. It's a singularity in the coordinate system they used. And in fact, you could find a transformation to a coordinate system in which the solution is perfectly regular. And indeed, what they had found was an exact solution for cylindrical gravitational waves. Leopold was very impressed, and he went to Einstein to say, you know, the, to discuss, you know, this, uh, this possible flaw in their work. Einstein later wrote that he had actually already figured this out by the time before Eddington, uh, before Infeld talked to him, but, so, but we'll never know for sure. So, uh, but anyway, Einstein and Rosen rewrote the paper with the title On Gravitational Waves, because it was now a, an exact solution with gravitational waves, but not did not send it to physical review. They uh, submitted it and it was published in the Journal of the Franklin Society, a rather obscure journal uh, published uh, out of Philadelphia. But for 50 years, there was, always, there was speculation about who the anonymous referee was. So finally, in 1988, Dan Kennefick, a well-known relativist and a, a historian of science, went to the physical review and talked them into going into the sub-basement and digging out their log books and looking at what, and, and so they did, opened up the book, received on such and such a date, Einstein, blah, 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 sent to H.P. Robertson of Robertson Walker metric fame. So Robertson, uh, who was then at Caltech, uh, was the actual referee of the paper. But it illustrates this, again, this idea in these, those early years of general relativity, there's a lot of conceptual confusion. In some sense, people in those days could, you know, they could talk the talk, but they couldn't walk the walk. You know, it, general relativity is generally covariant, so coordinates don't matter. But when confronted with coordinates that could move at the speed of thought, or coordinate singularities, they, 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 they got stuck, they couldn't really accept the fact that even a singularity in a coordinate system is perfectly acceptable. Coordinates have no physical meaning at all. Today, it's easy for us. We've been taught out of the textbooks that, uh, that have already adopted and accepted this point of view. But in, in these early years, it was still difficult to uh, fully appreciate the, what coordinate invariance meant. The real change came in the late 1950s with Herman Bondi and his group who proved with very rigorous techniques based on asymptotic infinity that gravitational waves are physical, they have physical effects, that when there's a flux of gravitational waves at infinity, the mass of the source that's producing the waves decreases, and all these were very rigorous, coordinate invariant, and in a very elegant manner, proved for all time the reality of gravitational waves, and that kind of set the tone for the future development of the subject. Around the same time, in the early 60s, Joe Weber was beginning to think about how one could actually detect these gravitational waves. And he began to build detectors based on solid cylinders of uh, aluminum with piezoelectric crystals glued along the middle so that when gravitational wave comes by and compresses the cylinder, the crystal will generate a little electrical current that you can read off. And in 1969, he made the stunning announcement that also made the New York Times that he had detected gravitational waves. And about a year later, he announced that based on the sensitivity of his, uh, directional sensitivity of his bars, the gravitational waves were coming from the center of the galaxy. And this was a tremendous, uh, this really changed things in a major way, both on the theory side and the experimental side. On the theory side, no one could understand uh, what these gravitation, what could possibly be the source of these waves. If, for those of you who know anything about gravitational wave detection, uh, the ground-based LIGO detectors, I'll show pictures in a moment, hope to detect a strain, a change in distance over distance, dimensional strain, at the level of 10 to the minus 21. 
if Weber was detecting gravitational waves and if knowing what we knew about his room temperature detectors, he was seeing signals at the level of 10 to the minus 13, 10 to the 8 times stronger in amplitude than what we really think is out there today. No one could explain this. So theorists tried to find ways to build models with synchrotron gravitational radiation was very popular. Particle going around a black hole maybe could beam the radiation like charges in an accelerator. So maybe the beaming could explain this huge amplitude. That didn't pan out. It doesn't exist. No such thing in, in gravity, general relativity. Another possibility, of course, was that general relativity was completely wrong. So maybe the correct theory of gravity would have sources that generate such strong gravitational waves. This had a personal impact on me because at that time I was a first year graduate student in, in Kip's group, just starting to sit in on his group meetings. So I was kind of hiding behind some senior graduate student. And Kip looked around the room and said, OK, Cliff Will, I, we need to find out if general relativity is correct. And I want you to find out everything there is to know about all the tests of general relativity and so on. And that launched my 45 year career thinking about tests of GR. And uh, so this. Weber, I thank Weber for uh, my, my career in some sense. It also had an important experimental impact because obviously people had to check this, build their own detectors and either verify or refute Weber's observations. And this had the important effect of bringing into gravitational physics a lot of people from other fields of science. Uh, particle physicists joined in, Dave Douglas, Tony Tyson from astronomy, um, and many other people who had, were working in other areas of physics but got excited by this and started building their own detectors. Ultimately, they showed, they proved that Weber had not been detecting gravitational waves. No one could reproduce his, his events. And so the consensus is that he was not seeing gravitational waves. But meanwhile, a number of these uh, pioneers who had cut their teeth building Weber-type bars began to think of an alternative way to detect gravitational waves based on laser interferometry. And some of these include uh, Bob Forward, Ron Drever, Ray Weiss, who then became the, 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 the champions of this new technique using uh, laser interferometry. Where you send a beam, a split a beam into two, send one down to mirrors at each end of a of an evacuated beam tube and look at the interference pattern to measure these tiny displacements at the level of parts in 10 to the 21 that a gravitational wave in, would induce. So today we have around the world an array of uh, two LIGO detectors in the USA, one in the state of Washington, one in Louisiana. Uh, these detectors have been, were upgraded some years ago to their advanced LIGO configuration and since the middle of September have been taking data in a science run and over the next few years we'll alternate science data, data taking with engineering runs to beat down the noise and so on to improve the detectors so that by 2018 they expect to be in a, at a sensitivity where they will, should be detecting gravitational waves on a regular basis. The Virgo detector in Italy is about a year behind, but on the same path in its uh, development of the advanced Virgo configuration. Uh, there's a 600 meter uh, instrument in, in Germany that's used mainly as a test bed for advanced uh, optical technologies that might be used in future, future detectors. Construction is complete now on an underground detector in the Kamioka mines in Japan, a project called Kagra, and they will be, they've installed beam tubes and will soon be, uh, by around 2018, beginning to uh, get online to start their uh, detection of gravitational waves. And there are plans for a future uh, gravitational wave instrument in, Li in India called LIGO South, uh, hopefully to be online by 2022. So these will detect gravitational waves in sort of the 100 hertz regime, and uh, many of us expect that in the next five years they will start really detecting gravitational waves regularly. Another technique is pulsar timing arrays, looking at fluctuations in signals from an array of pulsars around the, around the sky using telescopes around the world. By making coherent observations, they can detect gravitational waves in the nanohertz bandwidth, maybe from you know, in-spiraling, orbiting uh, supermassive black holes. And then for the future, there's LISA or ELISA, uh, a European a uh, space interferometer that's been adopted by the European Space Agency for a launch on, in, the, in its uh, 2034 uh, launch slot. Uh, three satellites orbiting the sun in an Earth-like orbit with laser beams going between, uh, from a central station to two others. NASA has just recently, within the past year, made a, a commitment, which in NASA language is a pretty strong statement, but you never know with any space agency, but it seems uh, pretty legitimate to join with ESA as a junior partner, putting in 
uh, some funding, and many of us hope that that will allow us to, them to install a third arm in this interferometer, which will actually improve the angular resolution dramatically. But an important milestone in eLISA has been reached just recently. This is LISA Pathfinder. It's a, it's a uh, technology demonstration mission to demonstrate a lot of the key technology that LISA will use. Drag-free control, uh, the optical bench that will be on the, on the spacecraft, and so on. It's scheduled for launch uh, on December 2 for a nine-month mission just to test out a lot of the very delicate technology that is critical for uh, LISA to work. Now, gravitational waves will open up a whole new form of astronomy, and that's also a whole different lecture that, uh, that one could give. Here, I just want to focus on a, a few specific tests of general relativity that you can do with the gravitational waves that are being detected. One of these, of course, is to look at the polarization of the gravitational waves. General relativity predicts only two modes of polarization. They would distort a ring of particles in that fashion, one like this, and the other one rotated by 45 degrees. This is often called the plus mode. That's often called the cross mode. And that's all. No matter what the source is, those are the only two modes of polarization of the gravitational waves. But other theories of gravity can predict as many as four additional modes. So if, and uh, the various detectors, the ground-based ELISA and the pulsar timing people have looked at ways within their context to you know, elucidate the polarization content of the waves that they detect. So any confirmed evidence of any of these four modes would be very bad news for general relativity because it's precisely zero uh, in, irrespective of the source. So this would be an important test of GR. Another important test is simply measure the speed of gravitational waves. Currently, we have no information whatsoever on, uh, or no direct information on their speed. And so, for example, if you were to detect a source at, say, 200 megaparsecs distance, and if you had a, an electromagnetic counterpart to the gravitational wave signal, and if you knew, for example, that the, uh, if you could figure out that the difference in time, either the difference in time of emission of the two signals or reception of the two signals, if you knew that to about one day's precision, even then, with such crude modeling of the source, you could get a limit at parts in 10 to the 12 on any difference in speed between gravity and light. So, so, and this is just because of the huge distances over which the two signals have to propagate. So you can get a very high precision test of the speed of gravitational waves almost from the first signal received that has any kind of electromagnetic counterpart. If, on the other hand, you're interested in a specific kind of uh, effect on the speed of gravitational waves, if the graviton happens to have a mass, then the gravitational waves would depend on their, their wavelength, the speed would depend on their wavelength, and so if, for example, you had a source of an in-spiraling uh, binary system of black holes where the stars go around each other, but they go faster and faster and faster as they get closer together, you get a signal that looks like this with an increasing frequency and an increasing amplitude. But if, gravitation, if the graviton has a mass, then gravitational waves emitted early in this in-spiral when the wavelength is long will propagate more slowly to your detector than gravitational waves emitted late when the, when the wavelength is short. And so the signal you receive at the detector, hundreds of megaparsecs away, will be squished in time compared to the emitted signal. And that squishing is a specific kind of distortion of the phase evolution of the waves that you can actually measure using a technique called mass filtering, which is the standard tool for studying these kinds of in-spiral signals at places like LIGO and Virgo. So uh, over the years, in, in my group and in other groups, we've estimated that with uh, either the ground-based or ELISA, you could put a lower bound on the Compton wavelength of the graviton at this level by doing this kind of matched filtering of, a, of an incoming signal, looking for a massive or wavelength-dependent propagation. And in fact, these in-spirals of two neutron stars or two black holes of one, each, or one of each is kind of rich in opportunities to test Einstein's theory. For example, this in-spiral wave when they're really just going around each other in a nice circular orbit or even an elliptical orbit, heading for the final uh, merger, this can be calculated now in general relativity with unbelievable accuracy uh, using post, what are called post-Newtonian techniques. So we have extremely precise predictions for this, uh, how this wave should go, and the detectors will measure how the wave goes with a comparable precision, and so one can look for deviations from general relativity in this in-spiral part of the waveform. 
The merger waveform, of course, samples strong field general relativity in its, all its full glory. With two black holes merge, neutron star merges with a black hole, and so on. And so there may be tests of uh, GR and tests of some weird effects that occur in certain scalar tensor theories in that merger part. And finally, the black hole will emit what are called ring down waves uh, uh, in a set of damped quasi normal mode radiation, settling down to its final stationary black hole. One can examine those ring down waves and test whether or not the final black hole really is a black hole of general relativity, because these waves satisfy very strict relationships among their frequencies and damping uh, that are unique to the Kerr black hole of general relativity. So there are some tests, strong field tests, that you can get by looking at those gravitational waves. And the future, I think, is rich in tests of GR using astrophysical means, looking at uh, various phenomena around neutron stars uh, and uh, black holes, and even inside neutron stars, testing things like the equation of state as well as alternative theories. And uh, something I won't even talk about, just testing general relativity at the extreme ranges, uh, cosmological effects, even short-range tests that are ongoing. So there's lots to do uh, for in these arenas. So I've tried to give you a kind of a, a mixture of history, talking about the early struggles to test general relativity, some of the great triumphs in the second half of his, that century, where we really started to test general relativity, at least in the solar system, in a binary pulsars to high precision. But I think as we look toward the second century of general relativity, we can see lots of excitement, lots of new ways to test general relativity to see whether Einstein will still be right by the time of the next centennial. Thank you. Sure. So, so Gravity Pro B was a, was a NASA mission to measure the so-called dragging of inertial frames, a rotating body in general relativity, drag space-time slightly around it, and so a gyroscope orbiting the Earth will precess relative to some distant star by a very tiny angle. Uh, for this particular experiment, it was 43 uh, milliarc seconds per year. The mission was launched after a very long period of development, almost 40 years of development, uh, was launched in uh, uh, 2004, April 2004, ended in September 2005. Uh, the, the, the initial results, the results were published in 2011. It turned out that during the mission, some anomalous torques on these gyroscopes were discovered, and so it took a, a great deal of effort, a great deal of model building to understand the origin of these torques. But in the end, they found a very robust model for these anomalous torques, so they could be uh, subtracted from the data or estimated along with the data, and they ended up with a believable and robust value for the uh, frame dragging at about the 20% level. They had hoped for a 1% test. In the end, they, because of all these problems, they reached 20%. And just by the way, literally last week, uh, my journal, Classical and Quantum Gravity, uh, published 21 papers giving all the complete details of Gravity Pro B in a, in a special issue. I mean, they published a FizRev letter, which is five pages, which tells you almost nothing except the result. These 21 papers tell, will tell you everything from spacecraft operations, how they fabricated the spheres, and the full three papers in giving the full detailed data analysis. So if you want to follow up, uh, that's, uh, that's available. Right, so, so, a lot, so a lot depends on the environment in which the black hole sits. If there's accretion, uh, if there are flows coming, about a, a star that's been disrupted with gas flowing in. So a lot depends on the, on the actual environment. And obviously, um, in addition to testing you know, black hole properties, they hope to really learn a lot about the environment around the hole there. Well, that's, that's the big challenge, obviously. Anything, anytime you want to test GR in an astrophysical scenario, you know it's a dirty problem, and that's... that's that's the challenge. Any other questions? Then, just one. Among all the different tests that GR has to pass, what would you, in your mind, be the most suspicious aspect of GR, where you, if, if there were to be found a problem, that would be the, the, the weakest thing? Um, well, I mean, I, I, of the ones that have been done, I, I don't see any 
that is, that is, that is like a, a weak link. Um, I mean, there's some that are done more precisely. I mean, frame dragging, we know to 20% uh, from Gravity Pro B, maybe somewhat better from uh, tracking certain satellites called Lagios. So you, we'd sort of like to know frame dragging better because it plays such an important role in astrophysics and you know, jets around black holes and so on. So it's, it's a very important astrophysical thing, so we'd like to test it better. It, it may be tested to 1% by tracking these Lagios type satellites. That, that would be very nice. But uh, you know, you're limited by technology ultimately. Um, measuring the light bending to a part per million, there are certain theories of gravity that, that say there might, there might be small deviations at that level. And so you'd like to explore that regime. Um, and another kind of test that really gets to the fundamentals is the, is the equivalence principle. Do bodies fall with the same acceleration, you know, irrespective of their composition? These are done in the laboratory these days, but people talk about space experiments to go to like part in 10 to the 18, which might reveal some effects that some models of you know, low energy string theory uh, predict. So, so it's really not, and the attitude is not quite what your question was, not to find flaws with GR, but to find physics beyond Einstein. So see you know, if some modification needs to be done consistent with everything that's known today. Um, no, oh, so, um, so when I talked about millions of stars in the galaxy, so they look at millions of stars and monitor their positions as a function of time. And as the, move, as the sun moves around the spacecraft, their positions move around like this because of the depending of light. Yeah. So all of this measurement was due to the potential of the sun? Due to the potential of the sun. So no Although actually, uh, you can, you, the deflection of light due to Jupiter has also been measured. Not to high precision, but you can see you can measure it. To what extent would the quantum theory of gravity change some of the uh, predictions of uh, general relativity? None. <laughs> None that are measurable. I mean, that's the big trouble with quantum gravity. It, you can develop it, but it's very, very difficult to find effects that are testable at sort of any, uh, you know, with any kind of realism. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you.